on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Live from our nation's capital, this is Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast with Gloria Purvis, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and Father Bjorn Lundberg. Heavenly Father, in this month of Our Lady the Rosary, we turn with confidence to you seeking Our Lady's prayers and intercession. We thank you for the grace of another day. We ask you to help us to discover ever more the mercy and love of Jesus in our life and to surrender our lives to you and trust you in all things through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Man may forget his creator or hide far from his face. He may run after idols or accuse the deity of having abandoned him. Yet the living and true God tirelessly calls each person to that mysterious encounter known as prayer. Through words and actions, this drama engages the heart. It unfolds throughout the whole history of salvation. That's a quote from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I thought that was just like right it's on awesome. the money, right? I yeah, was wondering if you guys had thoughts on that. Mm-hmm. That mysterious encounter known as prayer. I love that. It's one of probably my my favorite line from that section of the catechism. Mm-hmm. And because that's what prayer at its very core is, this intimate, loving communion with God. You're opening your heart and you're pouring yourself out before God and God is responding. And for me, the best place where that encounter happens is in Eucharistic adoration, you mm-hmm. know, and, and, and the silence and there's the Lord present there, body, blood, soul, divinity, the most blessed sacrament of the altar, uh, interceding for us with the father, just like he did when, he was here, you know, 2000 years ago. And um, I just love that encounter because that's where you get to know somebody. You yeah. have to talk to them, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and that's what we're doing in prayer. We're, we're, we're opening our hearts and talking to God. and He's responding back to us. Beautiful. You know, sometimes I feel like the Lord, I'm like, oh, if I'm up in the middle of the night, like if he wakes me up, like I, I'm like, okay, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Sometimes I'm like, is a reason I'm just like wide awake at like two in the morning. And I'm like, why is this happening? I'm like, oh, okay. He wants me to pray. He wants me to talk to him. So just try to be quiet and listen or meditate on him. Think about him, you know, so maybe turn those little uh, awake moments instead of those being moments of anxiety or stress, realize he's like, Hey, I need to do my daily check-in with you. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> you know? He has a different, morning, different yeah, that's that's right. I know, right? Right. So right. people are wondering, that's from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 2567. They could look that up. We are going to have a great show this morning. We're going to have a lot of wonderful discussion. What are we talking about, Deacon? Well, we're going to talk about the marriage pit and how can it be avoided. Can your spouse truly fulfill all of your hopes and desires and needs? Hmm. <laughs> no comment. I'll wait till we get to that part. <laughs> we'll also be talking about how do you, um, have you or your business ever done community service? There was a wonderful event by Catholic Charities in Maryland recently where there was a free dental clinic in Maryland that brought care to over 1,000 patients. And we'll talk about that and maybe find out from our listeners what their companies are, are doing in the community. And then Cardinal Newman is going to be canonized on Sunday in Rome. And I wanted to share about how we can get the confidence of a saint because Cardinal Newman was in a really difficult spot where he was being branded an extremist by all these different camps in the church. And yet he was becoming Catholic at the same time. And how did he do it? How did he stay close to the Lord in prayer and navigate all that? So how can we have that confidence today? Mm -hmm. And of course we want your text messages. And why don't you text us? I text in the letters EWTN to 55000, wait for a response, then text your first name, how you're listening, and your comment. Join the conversation. So uh, there is something happening very important today at the Supreme Court. There's a case called RG and GR Harris Funeral Homes versus the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And the reason this is important is because of what is happening with the case. Basically, Harris Funeral Homes declined to allow a male funeral director to violate the company's sex-specific dress code by dressing and presenting as a woman when working with clients. That, that is a family and friends of deceased loved ones. Um, this man called himself Amy Stevens, I believe is what he called himself, and I guess was indicating that he's now a woman but, and decided he was going to change from dressing according to the male dress code to the female dress code. So then... He, they, as they said, no, he can't do that. We'll have to let you go. So then, um, uh, 
basically some unelected federal bureaucrats basically convinced the lower court to rewrite the meaning of sex discrimination. So sex no longer was is physical, biological sex, but rather gender identity, what you think it is. And, and this basically would change the meaning of sex for more than half a century in the law. Right. And um, you have some radical feminist women's group actually writing a friend of the court brief to side with the funeral home because they're saying, if you do this, you're basically erasing the meaning of yes. female in the law and all sex-based protections. This is and fascinating. So it is yeah. fascinating because this case has brought together a myriad of groups from all different sides of the spectrum to say, right. um, no, you know what I mean? And it also right. puts this whole trans thing right in the crosshair. And what is the Supreme Court going to do? How are they going to rule on this case? So this is really Because um, if you look at this, if you look at, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, what's the, what's one of the, the abortion cases that came up where they said the heart of liberty you know, is the right to define whatever, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> whatever that is. Yeah, I, I mean, don't it remember. Was like yeah. Planned Parenthood mm. versus Pacey or Casey or something. But mm. the basic point is, I don't know if the court's going to dance around it or address it, but basically, if you can define reality, then how do you have society? How do you have okay. any social order? If you have no truth, if you have no objective reality, then, you know, w- right now it's, oh, I, I'm, a, I'm a man, I want to dress as a woman. And I mean, an employer says, fine, you can do that, but I don't necessarily want you working here. Well, then what about when you start, like there's people today who dress like they're kids or people who dress like they're animals, you know? So is it like suddenly your employee gets to hold you hostage because, you know, they say, well, this is who I am. This is how I feel. Okay, fine. You can do that. But do I have to employ you for that? Well, it's it's no difference to me. If someone wanted to work for me and they're, they're covered with tattoos and piercings in their face, Right. You can't work for me because you because you are representing me and what I stand for when you're meeting with people. And if you, if you choose, you make your free will decision to look like that. You right. cannot work for me, period. That's nothing to do with your skills. That's great. But but you are representing me and what I stand for. And that look does not you know, if you choose to do that to yourself, you right. know, then you can't you can't work for me because you're not going to represent because people are going to be so looking at you. They're not going to be focusing on what you're trying well, to accomplish. Well, so that that's the whole thing. So they're saying, can you say to someone, can you make it gender specific? Can you say, so uh, th- that would be something they'd say, well, that's just broad across the uh, board, right? That's male and female. But here, the question is, can you tell men they have to dress a certain way and women that have to dress a certain way? And a reporter uh, tweeted out, this is interesting, that SCOTUS sends us standard media instructions, including a reminder that the press section dress code is business attire, coat yeah. and tie required for men. <laughs> yeah. So right. SCOTUS in their media instructions are saying there's a, a dress code for the press and that men have to wear a coat and tie on a case about whether or not an employer can tell, you know, right. it is employees that you have to, that there's a dress code for men and a dress code for women. Maybe they'll argue the difference is that this is optional. You don't have to, if you don't well, like look, it, you that don't guy's have to confused. show up that way for press stuff. Well, that guy's um, confused, and we can't confirm people in their confusion. Is the bottom line for me? Right. Bottom line for you. What do you think, Father? Bottom line. I just think. I mean, at the end, it's like it's gonna. This is gonna affect so many things potentially. Like, do you get to tell the entire building that the bathrooms have to be redone because now you feel like a woman? And I mean, there's just this article I was reading about. There's like these people in in England who have done transgender stuff, and who are now going going back to their original biological gender. And they're saying how they weren't served by doctors and everybody who just, yeah. you know, pushed them along this. I mean, again, it's like, are we going to live in objective reality or not? Because if at the end of the day, every person can define whatever reality is for them about how they dress or how they go to work or how they interact mm-hmm. with other people in the bathroom, then do you have any social order left or you just have chaos? Well, yeah, what would exactly. happen here is if, if this case goes forward, the meaning of sex is out the window. So people might say, hey, you don't right. need to change the bathroom because... You are whatever you say you are. So we need hmm. to keep um, keep the uh, alliance defending freedom in, in, prayer in prayer as they go before yeah. the court today to make oral, oral arguments in this Harold's fun- Harris Funeral Homes versus the EEOC. Let's see. What else are we going to talk about? Oh, Vicki Thorne. Yeah. Vicky so, uh, yeah. So my, my alma mater, University of Notre Dame, the D. Nicholas Center for Ethics and Culture, will be aro- awarding their Evangelium Vitae Medal to Vicki Thorne. 
And the mm. uh, Evangelium Vitae Medal is the nation's um, most important lifetime achievement award for heroes in the pro-life movement, uh, mm. honoring individuals who, whose um, efforts have served to really proclaim the gospel of life by mm. steadfastly affirming and defending the sanctity of human life in uh, all its forms and in all its stages. And, of course, Vicki Thorne is well known for uh, founding Project Rachel, yeah. um, w which is a post-abortive healing uh, and reconciliation ministry. And it's just, she's done phenomenal work. I had a chance to meet her uh, last year as well when I, when I gave a keynote at a pro-life dinner. And um, she's just incredible. Her, her videos, uh, for example, the biology of the theology of the body is just, mm -hmm. is just incredible. So yeah. I can't think of a, a better person th this next year to, to get this award than, than Vicki Thorne. You know, it's exciting. I mean, because it's, it's kind of interesting because this De Nicola Center for Ethics and Culture, you know, they, they lead a lot of discussion about Catholic moral and intellectual tradition at Notre Dame. And Father Jenkins, the president, has come out endorsing, you know, the medal and Bishop Rhodes and a lot of pro-life leaders, uh, um, Helen Alvarez. So it's exciting to try to see them, you know, contribute to advancing the pro-life cause by, um, by making such a high emphasis on this. So. You know, and I, and I think it, uh, to me, it's a message to the students in the whole campus about what's important. And I'm like, that's a that's a good thing, in, in, in my opinion. That's a really, really good thing. And, and and you know what? I'm sure Vicky probably is like, oh, I'm fine. I don't need the award. But yeah. you know, I'm glad that she's getting some um, some kudos for the very, very tough and necessary work that she's doing. I mean, she's I, so I don't positive. Know. Yeah, she's yeah, so positive she really and she's dealing with people who are, you know, really have been hurting and really yeah. harmed. So, I, you know, God I, bless her. So there's something else that um, to discuss. Um, everybody probably is aware of the case out of Dallas where the police officer entered this man's apartment and shot him as he was eating ice cream. Well, what they might not know is that one of the key witnesses for the prosecution, Joshua Brown, was murdered a few days after the 10-year uh, sentence was handed down to Amber Geiger. Now, what makes this... Is there a connection between Amber Geiger and this? Yes. Well, he was the main... He was basically a witness for the prosecution. And they said he was worried that he would be... Something bad would happen to him because he came forward and testified. Now, what makes people think that perhaps this is connected is that he was shot several times, but shot in the mouth. Mm. Like, is there a message that you don't, so that people talk, are like, we need talk. to, yeah, his apartment was directly across from Botham Jean's apartment when the shots rang out. And he took the stand and testified on behalf of the prosecution. So he was in constant fear, they said, that he would be the next victim. Okay. But so wow. people want answers. His mother's devastated. Everybody's looking for that. So let's pray that justice will prevail in Joshua Brown's case in, 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 in the investigation for who murdered him. So, wow. So, well, coming up, we're going to talk about the marriage pit and how can it be avoided on Morning Glory. Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast. It's quarter after. We're right at your fingertips. Text us at 55000 to start. Wait for a response. Then text your first name and question. Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast. Yep, you're listening to Morning Glory. We are Catholic from coast to coast. We hope to be the cup of coffee for your soul. So wake up, everybody. I'm Gloria <laughs> Purvis. <laughs> is that a morning cup of coffee? I felt that from here. <laughs> you felt that? Uh, felt that. Wake up. <laughs> <laughs> Who needs coffee? Got Gloria. I know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I'm joined, by, uh, I'm joined by <laughs> Father Bjorn Lundberg. He's the pastor of Sacred Heart Church out in Winchester, Virginia. And we've got the dynamic Deacon Harold Burke Sivers with us this morning. He's a fantastic co-host and longtime friend. Father's a longtime friend as well. But um, also, if you're going to tweet, just letting you know, I'm tweeting out links to everything we're discussing on Twitter. You can find that information at Gloria underscore Purvis. Look for the hashtag Morning Glory and be sure to tag EW, at EWTN Radio if you're going to respond or add your comments. So, Deacon, 
you know, everybody talks about marriage, right? And let's be honest, sometimes people fall into what we could call a marriage pit. Is there ever a way to really dig out of it? Yes, there is. You know, and, and the, the reason I bring this up, because when I, when I give my talk on marriage, I talk about, of course, Genesis. Mm -hmm. And I, I talk about, you know, how in Genesis 2, God tried to bring all the animals because he wanted to find a, a, a helpmate, a zeta connecto mm -hmm. in, in Hebrew for him. And all the animals didn't work. And so he you know, built, takes a rib and builds up a woman and brings it to him. And now he looks at this person created in that same beautiful original solitude as he is, that he can know himself, he can, he can know God, uh, and now he has somebody to share that experience with. So he's looking at someone that completes him, that perfects him, that beautifully complements him. But that only goes so far <laughs> because that relationship uh, is really rooted in the fact that, that their ultimate relationship is with God, mm -hmm. right? And that marriage is a, a symbol of, uh, or a representation of what our relationship is going to be like with God forever in heaven. So mm -hmm. marriage on earth anticipates the, the, as it says, Revelation 19, verse nine, right? The, the, the wedding feast of the lamb anticipating life with God forever in heaven. But sometimes we think my spouse can fulfill Mm -hmm. All of my needs and desires to be respected and admired and loved and nurtured and cared for. And that's true, but only to a limited extent, mm -hmm. because it has to be rooted in the fact that God is the one that's going to ultimately fulfill all of your hopes and desires and needs. Your spouse can't do that. But the marriage trap is believing that your spouse can actually fulfill all of your needs and desires on this earth. And they can't. And that often leads to tension and frustration within the marriage uh, as well. Um, because, you know, sometimes you think you, you start taking each other for granted sometimes. Okay, I've got, okay, I'm married and I got that part of my life done. Now I can focus on my career and I can focus right. on this and I can focus on the other aspect. Or now the kids start coming and then it becomes about managing the marriage. Mm -hmm. Uh, bills and mortgage and driving the kids here, taking care, and they, they they often don't really um, their prayer life maybe starts to suffer and, and they start to the, the relationship begins to change. Maybe someone's spiritual life is growing, the other one's not growing as fast, and these things start to happen. and And we want to be, be uh, careful. To remember that the, the two are one flesh, and so they have to remember that their their ultimate focus as that the two are one is focusing on keeping God as the heart and the center and the core of that married relationship. I like something yeah. you said that when people try to make the person as if, you know, um, you're supposed to be, make me completely happy. You're supposed to this, you're supposed to that. And I, I think that's not true. You know, I don't think you can point to another person and make them solely responsible for the source of your happiness. And I think having that attitude can be dangerous in a marriage because it doesn't, make the person be you don't see them as a whole person you see them as having just one purpose to to fulfill your happiness and i think that that's dangerous you have to understand we do say for better and for worse right sometimes they're gonna make you cry sometimes they're gonna make you angry you know but that's just dealing with another the whole human person in a relationship it's interesting because as a priest when you're doing <clears throat> you you have when you have your appointments on your calendar Okay, a number of consistent things happen. You got a couple coming in for marriage prep. You have someone coming in and their marriage is ending. You have someone coming in and their marriage is going through a rough time. And this all this kind of goes back to some of this, you know, this wisdom, Deacon, that I'm so glad you brought up because I want to use an example of someone I know I've worked with as a priest who at one point in their marriage, they were really looking at divorce. And now they they never did get a divorce. The marriage is good. It's quite strong. They're very happy. But there was a point, which was very normal, like a lot of people, a lot of couples, where they were ready to get divorced. And then one of the spouses said to me at one point, they said, when I realized my spouse could not meet my needs and fulfill me, this was a turning point for healing the marriage. And I think it's fascinating when you're sitting down with a couple, typical couple today is either living together or cohabitating or, I mean, or, or just intimate already. They don't generally practice the faith. They have been evangelized. They may have gotten some sacraments in the past, but they have no relationship mm -hmm. with God. And if, if they were honest and could admit it, they really do go into this marriage expecting that if they've made the right choice, they found their soulmate and their soulmate is going to completely fulfill them. Mm -hmm. And I can almost guarantee that 25 years from now, they're going to be heading for a divorce. 
Mm. because they will have gone through this process and woken up one day and said, we're not intimate, we don't talk, we're so burnt out, we've been trying for so long to make this work, I made a wrong choice, we should leave. But then when you look at the patterns of marriage, people who get divorced, when they remarry, they're usually the divorce rate goes up. So this whole question is fascinating because I think many, many people, of course you want them to be very happy in marriage and with God, Mm -hmm. like you say, Mm -hmm. they can be happy in marriage, but without God, I think people make their spouse their God. Well, Well, but but so, so what is happiness, right? Because, um, if I I met this couple, um, and I thought "Mm, their marriage is going to have problems because all the girl could talk about is how they never argue. And they were newlyweds. And I was like, what do you mean never argue? We never (laughs) argue. And she just thought that was so, uh, you know, example of such a good and healthy. And I was like, no, it's not that you don't argue. It's but how do you argue? You know, it's okay to have disagreements. It's about how do you argue the, the healthiness of it. And somehow she thought that you know, if you never disagree, that was a sign of a perfect relationship. Look, what do you all listen? What do you listeners think? Why don't you email us, Mona and Glory at EWTN.com. Tell us your first name and how you're listening. And how would you have worked through marriage difficulties or how have you worked through marriage difficulties? Or do you know of someone who has worked through marriage difficulties? I mean, you, um, you know. You know, I had I had a married a couple that came to me once that wasn't part of the parish or anything, but they just knew me from EWTN, and they thought, oh, he did a series on marriage. He could help us. So they came in. It was like in the first couple of times, it was like a tennis match. It was like back and forth, back and forth, a complaint, complaint, this person did this, did that, the other thing. And I was helping them work through that. And then all of a sudden things changed because the man found out, the, the, the husband found out he had cancer. Hmm. And now all of a sudden, all the things and all the bickering and all the things that, that the, the little things that they were causing all these huge problems in the marriage, all of a sudden became insignificant. All of a sudden God came back into the picture and it became Mm. all about saving his life. And, you know, and the whole emphasis changed. And that really struck me as as a huge kind of lesson in all of that. And I said, why don't we treat our spouse as if they had cancer every day? Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, we we just, sometimes we just take things for granted. Just assume you're going to wake up the next morning and things will be just like they were the day before, whatever. But wait a minute. What if we really recognize, why do we have to bring God in when things are going bad? Why can't we make God the the heart and center of our life every day and see our spouse through the lens of, of ultimately relationship with, with God and with Christ. And it's not wait till something bad happens and, and, and then bring God into the picture. Um, and, and I think it's, like, yeah, because we get so busy, you know, we, so we sometimes put God to the side. Yeah, I think this is part of the whole crisis of faith. Pope Benedict talked about this 50 years ago, and he's been talking about it ever since, that, you know, the crisis in the church is fundamentally a crisis of faith. Not to criticize people, but there's just a lack of belief. People don't believe in God. They don't believe in what he's revealed. They don't believe in the truths of the gospel. And so, therefore, it's not part of their life. And in everything else in their life, whether it's their career, their academic pursuits, their health, their finances— they invest big time in it. They put, they sacrifice, they put money away, they work out. But then when it comes to their marriage and it comes to God, there's this big assumption that somehow this is automatically supposed to work. Automatically, mm-hmm. you know, it's supposed to be part of their life. And for many, many people, God isn't part of their life at all. There's no prayer life. They don't have a relationship with him. They know about him. They don't know him. And this really mm-hmm. impacts their marriage. You know, I just, um, you know, thinking of troubled marriages and stuff that I've uh, been ex- experienced with other people, there's a lot of mess out there, y'all. And yeah. there's a lot of bad advice that people get too. And uh, I think people just need to grow up about what it is to be in a relationship with another human being that is not yourself. And what yeah. does love mean? And what does sacrifice mean? And what does willing the best for the other mean? You know, stop with all Holoquin romance novels. And I'm not saying it's not all, you know, that there are beautiful and bright moments. Like my husband just walked in unannounced just now and gave me a cup of coffee as an act of love that I didn't even ask for, right? Those kinds of things, I think, are what we need to turn toward rather than looking at these grand, uh, you know, fairy tale things that just aren't true. Oh, what do we got coming up, uh, Gloria? Well, we're going to talk about um, this free dental clinic that was in Maryland and helped a thousand indigent people. And it begs, the, it asks the question, what are your companies doing to help the community around you? And how do you get the confidence of a saint amid all the storms of your life? Stay tuned. And of course, your tweets. You can tweet us 
at EWTN Radio. So grab your favorite morning beverage or just wait for a morning slap from Gloria. <laughs> and join us around the breakfast table of faith on Morning Glory. Her husband will bring you coffee. This is Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast. On the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Live from our nation's capital, this is Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast with Gloria Purvis, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and Father Bjorn Lundberg. Heavenly Father, amid the storms of life and the chaos of our modern times, we want to hear your still small voice speaking to us in the silence of our hearts that you call us to know your love and to discover it every every day anew amidst the ups and downs and challenges that we face, help us to know your love today and surrender all things to you through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. My fate has filled many with awe, but you are my mighty refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise, with your glory all the day long. Do not reject me now that I am old. When my strength fails, do not forsake me. When my strength fails, do not forsake me. Um... Sometimes it happens when you're not old, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not old, but Lord, you know. Please, Jesus, help me out. <laughs> That's so true. You know, just being real, yo. <laughs> so that's the case. I love that. I love that about the psalm. And the, when you read earlier in the psalm, Psalm 71 here, it starts off in you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. I mean, I just that's the thing to remember. We can take refuge in the Lord and we should. He is our refuge from the storm. And I'm, I'm thankful for the Lord. So. Anyway, that's my comment on Psalm 71. And I love when you pick these Psalms, Deacon, because it's a lot to really think about. And I'm sure you have some more to add about Psalm 71 historically or whatever that maybe you want to say. Oh, well, it's one of the ones that's not attributed. So it's not attributed to uh, David or Asaph or Korah. Um, it's just it's just it's one of these Psalms of surrender. And I love that, especially when you're getting older. Mm-hmm. Now you you wake up, you're like, oh, wait a minute. Where'd that pain come from? <laughs> <laughs> You know, wait a minute now. I'm not. I'm not 25 anymore. You know, it's, 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 well, actually, it's a pain is a, a reminder that you know that that where our life is going to come to an end. You know, it's just being as I get older. You know, and and you get a little bit more pain, a little bit this or that, and you know, it's just a, a reminder that um, that 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 we're physical and our life is going to come to an end. So. Um, you know, you living know, for heaven and preparing for that even now. I also I also wonder if all the aches and pains of aging is also a way for the Lord to say, look here, y'all were messing up in you. So I'm going to give you these things that you can offer me, you know, to do some <laughs> do some penance. <laughs> it's built into living. Here's some things you all need to offer up, you know, when your back hurts in the morning or you can't do that thing you used to be able to do when you're young. You're just like, Lord, I'm offering this up. But what else are we going to be talking about later on in the show, Father? Well, we're going to talk about how you have the confidence of a saint, but I feel like we should be talking about how the more the day starts with a slap from Gloria and then you your hands for your sins. Yeah, I got to wake up. you here on Morning Glory, how you can turn it around. <laughs> you can turn it around. That's right. So, you know, I came across this story in Maryland about a free dental clinic that was hosted by Catholic Charities of Washington, D.C., and it offered preventive and emergency dental care to get this more than 1,000 patients in need. Now, they say that the majority of the people who were there were uninsured and probably had not seen a dentist in years. Now, the event was hosted um, by Catholic Charities, the University of Maryland School of Public Health, and the Maryland State Dental Association Foundation. Now, they said there were people lining up from the night before the clinic. There was a 69-year-old woman that stood in line at 6.40 p.m. the night before. This woman's name was Linda Frazier, and she told um, the local Catholic paper that she was suffering from a painful tooth and had not received dental care in two years since the last Mission of Mercy happened in Mid-Maryland. She said she could not afford insurance, insurance, and she was grateful to have the opportunity to receive treatment through Catholic Charities. Now, for those who are wondering, well, how could this be? Maryland does not include full dental coverage for patients on Medicaid. 
So low ind individual in, uh, low income individuals and people without insurance might find themselves struggling to get the dental care they need. And also in the greater Washington DC area, several years ago, there was a case of a little boy who was from a low income family. They were homeless. He had a toothache. And by the time they got him medical care, he actually died from the infection mm -hmm. of the toothache. Mm -hmm. So dental care is important very important and people can die if uh, if they have serious dental problems and do not get help so Gloria, who is behind this i mean we know it's catholic charities but what was the inspiration to do this i mean because this is really kind of stuff that could be done all over the country well they said mission of mercy originated in virginia your state about 20 years ago when this doctor, Dr. Terry Dickinson, he's a former executive director of the Virginia Dental Association, basically saw a major unmet need for dental care among low-income patients, seniors, and people with disabilities. So it's basically this doctor just looking out uh, uh, on the landscape and seeing, if you will, his neighbors that are in need. You know, who's your neighbor? The, the person next to you. So he's like, look, there are low-income people, senior citizens, and people with disabilities that just aren't getting their needs met. And we need to come together with our skills as dentists and offer these people care free of charge. So they said it was a, the first small event was held in rural Virginia with a group of dentists from the Virgin, Virginia Dental Association. And they said people lined up literally overnight to get help. And apparently 42 other states have adopted the Mission of Mercy model which creates free dental clinics with volunteer dentists and support personnel to provide services. So. Wow. You know, that, that really is important because with a lot of these health plans, dental's not included. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it's like you, you get this health package. And oh, yeah, do you have to, if you want your eyes checked, it's this package add on. Mm -hmm. If you want your teeth checked, it's this package add on. Yeah, mm -hmm. so th that's really important, though, to get the, to, that the folks are doing this. And, I mean, it's uh, yeah, I worked for a nonprofit in Portland that was doing something very similar to this, uh, that partnered with Oregon Health Sciences um, University, and they kind of this mobile medical, a uh, mobile dental, um, you know, uh, thing where the, the 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 mobile truck would come and and work with low income people um, on mm. uh, getting their teeth fixed so they can go and get jobs. You know, if their yeah. if their mouth looks right now, they can go and and we also would provide suits and interviewing skills mm -hmm. and and help people get employment. That the, but the dental was part of it. So, but so check this out. People might not realize the Affordable Care Act, there's no money in it for dental services. There's no money <laughs> in the Affordable Care Act for dental services. And I'm sorry, but in the United States, uh, your smile, your mouth is, is really important. You see a lot of times in, on TV and movies how they make fun of the British for quote unquote having bad teeth. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, that's that, true. Right? They do make fun of that. But here, people like your smile is really important. Your mouth is really important. And, and also think about the pain of like having a cavity that's not treated or you have teeth missing or cavities on your front teeth. Well, the, these clinics help people get their teeth cleaned and get their teeth um, filled and they can smile. And they said sometimes that, you know, helps if you're going for a job interview or working on a job, being able to smile. So there's a real socioeconomic impact on the patient and the family and the children. And this goes a long way for what they're doing, but it does make me wonder. How, is it, what are people doing? Is there anybody out there like Dr. Terry Dickinson and saying, you know what, who around me is falling through the cracks and how can I use my skills and encourage people with the same skills or other businesses to help these people free of charge? I mean, I'm wondering what other businesses are doing to reach out and help the community. And maybe some of our listeners could let us know. Maybe they could email us morningglory at EWTN.com and tell us what's going on in your community. Or maybe you mm -hmm. might say, I know there's a need uh, in my community who's willing to help. Maybe there's something people falling through the cracks or something that's a big deal that you think, well, we need to, we need to maybe try to step up and help these kind of people, help people in these situations. You know, one That's thing nice. I went to, I haven't been, uh, you know, because mm -hmm. again, on the, the Affordable Care Act did not include dental. And so um, it's only recently that my wife and I were able to get dental coverage. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, when I, when I went to the dentist and they said, you haven't been to the dentist in how long? I said, probably like seven years or so. And he mm -hmm. said, you have no cavity. Said, and, and, she, and the doctor said, you're not from here, are you? From Oregon. I said, nope, I'm from New Jersey. 
And he said, oh, you have fluoride in the water when you were growing up, right? I said, sure oh. I did. And he said, oh, they see, it's, and it, but it's, it got an organ. This was very controversial because one of the things they wanted to do to help people with their teeth was to put fluoride in the water. But, of course, being from Oregon, conspiracy theory, the government's putting stuff in our water, trying to kill us or whatever. <laughs> and and that, that didn't go anywhere, you know. But mm. um, you know, that may be something um, that people want to consider, too. Oh, I, you know, that's interesting. I didn't realize that Oregon – was like no, no, nothing in the no. I, you know, I, yeah. I, I did. I, I learned something new. Thank you, Deacon, for that. Uh, we heard from David. He emailed that heart health is directly related to dental health. Yeah, I've heard, for, right? I've heard that. Right, I've heard that. I wish David How, or somebody what is there, would help I wonder what us. that yeah. relationship is because I've heard mean? like, oh, we go for a dental procedure, then some heart thing happened. Like, yeah. well, how? Do, I, I'm fascinated. That? How did that work? Maybe if there's a doctor that could let us, Ohio. or a dentist could let us know. Yeah. Debbie yeah. from Hubbard, Ohio says our community also provides free dental care on a Friday in October. What? So nice. People yeah. are going to be like, can I move to Hubbard, Ohio? <laughs> 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 you know what I'm saying? I mean, because it can be really expensive if you don't have insurance and you opt to go to a dentist and you want to get a cleaning and they want to take some x-rays. You know, I'm sure that could be upwards of $500, depending on yeah. where you are in the country. It's just not cheap. Multiply that by every person's mouth in the family. Oh, my goodness. That's a lot yeah. of money. So, you know, I, I'm glad to hear that there's some places that are um, – are helping that they have free dental care in Hubbard, Ohio on Fridays. That's fantastic. Right before the weekend too. So people go out with their mouth smelling good and pretty teeth. We heard David from New Hampshire emails. He said, our parish is St. Vincent de Paul society and his parish is St. Michael in Exeter, New Hampshire has its own mobile dental van and they are constantly providing free dental services. David from New Hampshire says, God is so good. He sure That's is. Awesome. And so is the That's people fantastic. in St. Michael's Parish in New Hampshire. Y'all, a mobile dental van? Oh, awesome. yeah, wow. Yes, yeah, so isn't that great that people that have these? Fantastic. I didn't even know all this was going on. That's fantastic. I mean, I am, first of all, I'm just like, can how can I be down with their parish? <laughs> you, know <what> I mean? <laughs> you know, you know, a mobile dental van, first of all, the expense to get that and then have somebody to be able to provide the dental care. That is that's beautiful. That's fantastic. I'm like, God has really blessed them. I guess when the people have a, a will to help, the Lord will really bless them. May we all take on some of the things that they're doing at St. Michael in Exeter, New Hampshire. That's, that's fantastic. You know, one of the things I was thinking about is how many dentists also go to like Haiti or Cuba or whatnot. Oh, for right. Yep. Y'all, mm -hmm. I don't, I think that's great, but maybe they could also maybe do some of that here in the States for people that don't have dental care. I wonder if they could do something. I I, I'm like sure they must have something. Mm -hmm. The role of the laity today, because, you know, we look at for, uh, for an early generation in America really depend on religious who made the sacrifice to help run schools and hospitals and all kinds of charitable works. But with mm -hmm. the crisis that's in religious life right now, you know, and Vatican II and the call to holiness, um, people should use their talents, get organized, get your Vincent DePaul Society and your dental bands and everything going. You know, get out there and get organized. And I wonder if there might be some kind of um, loan forgiveness if if people or even for dental students as a part of their dental training to offer free health care. But if there's any kind of loan forgiveness, the federal government would do for dentists or doctors that come out of med school and dental school working in low income oh, and good, indigenous yeah. populations. Yeah, there must be some kind of something. I, I imagine there must be. But for the rest of us who didn't go to medical school or dental school or whatever, we'd still have some gifts and talents that we could reach out and say who in our community is falling through the cracks and how might we be able to help them and maybe follow the example of Dr. Terry Dickinson and get people together to serve and help that community. Really good stuff. What else do we have coming up on Morning Glory? Do you need confidence? Maybe you want to have the confidence of a saint. Let's talk about Plus, John Henry Newman is going to be canonized on Sunday and what he can teach us about our time in the church and have a confidence that's rock solid. Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast. It's quarter till. You're invited to be a part of Morning Glory. We're on Twitter at hashtag Morning Glory. Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast. Yes, and you're listening to Morning Glory. I'm your co-host, Deacon Harold Burke Sibbers, and I'm joined by Father Bjorn Lumberg, who's always uh, insightful and, and thoughtful. Just uh, I, you know, I love how our godly councils 
bring different um, different a different feel, a different aspect uh, of the faith. It's just wonderful. And of course, and of course, joined by everybody's favorite, Gloria Purvis. <laughs> Uh, as well, who's just who's Everybody. just awesome and just so right. honored to just call her my friend, and it's so so glad to be working with her on the show here. And of course, we'd love to hear from you. You can send us a text message, text the letters E W T N to five five zero zero zero. Wait for a response. It takes your first name, how you're listening, and your comment. And remember that data and mobile rates may apply. Mm. And so, Father Bjorn, how do we get the confidence of a saint? Well, I just uh, texted Secret to Gloria. She's going to tweet it out. It's um, mm-hmm. how are we going to share that. There's a great letter from the provost of the Brompton Oratory in London who is reflecting on the canonization this Sunday of uh, John Henry Newman. Deacon Gloria, are you at all familiar with John Henry Newman, his life, anything about him that you have been drawn to or thought about, read about in the past? Is this the one? See, I get the last names confused. This is the one that's a convert. Yes, this is not this is not Newman Neumann, St. John Neumann Neumann okay. from Philadelphia, who was the Archbishop. This is John Henry Newman, who was from the Oxford movement in the Anglican mm-hmm. Church and then who converted. Okay. Yeah, I Deacon, think his search for truth is the one that, that, that gets me, is his search for the truth. I have to tell you he's not somebody that I followed closely. I'm all up into Teresa Vavila yeah, and Kevin yeah. of Siena. Mm. Not to say he's not somebody good, but so educate me, Father. Yeah, no, I, I think you're going to want to learn about this wonderful man. So John Henry Newman was a leading light in Oxford and in the Anglican Church, Church of England. And then in the 19th century, he went through every kind of crisis you can think of in the sense that he had this bright career ahead of him. He was brilliant, um, crazy, amazing academic and he had a very promising career in the Church of England. And then God began to work in his life, spiritually and with history and theology. And he was drawn to come into communion with the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. And then he suffered like on all sides because within his own tradition, he was you know, rejected because there was, there was this Oxford movement in England that wanted to help Anglicans rediscover more the fullness of their Catholic history, if you want to put it that way. Mm-hmm. And so there were many Anglicans who wanted to dive deeper into the richness of the church's traditions, but they thought that they could still stay in the Anglican church. And then when he felt, well, when he was led by God to embrace the fullness of union with the Holy See, with the Holy Father, um, so he was, you know, misunderstood by his former friends and abandoned there. His career was at, you know, total standstill, and he mm-hmm. had a very promising future ahead of him. But then within the Catholic world, there was all kinds of mess because this is the 1800s. We're getting close to 1870 with the um, First Vatican Council. And there were these two polar extremes going on in the Catholic Church then, which we actually still sort of see today. That's why he's a prophet for our time. There was mm. the ultramontanist movement, which means ultramontanism means beyond the mountains. And it was this attitude that everything coming out of Rome was the most important thing. You say, well, Father, aren't you a Catholic priest? What are you saying? It's the idea that if the Pope gets up in the morning and says, I had chicken soup for lunch yesterday, then everybody as a good Catholic should have chicken soup. And that papal <laughs> infallibility means, you know, anything the Pope says is inspired by God. Well, That's of course, we, we love the Pope. We love the Holy Father. But then when the debate came up at Vatican I about papal infallibility, you had one extreme that was obviously very supportive of it. But then you had another extreme that said, no, you know, this is too much. The Pope, you know, that it's dangerous territory to talk about papal infallibility. A lot of times our Christian friends who are Protestant or other areas, other denominations will say, you Catholics think the Pope is infallible on every matter. No, there's very careful areas where the Pope speaks infallibly under the guidance of the Holy Spirit to clarify matters of doctrine or dogma. So Newman mm-hmm. is caught in between in this Catholic extreme. He's not an ultramontanist. He's also not rejecting papal infallibility. He's also dealing with the problems in his former tradition. So in many ways, he was a hero. He was a prophet. He was lonely. He suffered a lot. And he wrote beautifully about, you know, this beautiful poetry and theology wrote the lead kindly light. You know, this whole idea that God and his providence is always guiding us. Now, in your faith, you know, as a convert, Gloria, and deacon in Mm -hmm. your life and ministry, are there, were there times where you kind of felt you were alone, like you didn't even see where God was, how God was acting in your life, and you just had to take like one step at a time? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. When my, my mother was in a coma, when I suffered through 15 years of infertility, yeah, you just have to trust and, and you might not be able to see the step in front of you, but you believe you're not going to fall off a cliff because you're trusting and walking in, you know, walking in the footsteps of Jesus. Yeah, when I was the same thing, when I was discerning uh, monastic life and then left and then you know, I met my, the woman who had to be my wife, but then I almost went back to the monastery because I wasn't sure if I was supposed to be married. And then recently, you know, uh, leaving my career in campus law enforcement to speak and write full time, <laughs> just back and forth, like, ah, what are you doing, God? But when you look mm -hmm. back in retrospect, it all makes sense of, yeah. of, right. of how God was working in your life, you know, and, and I now I can't imagine doing anything else. For our listeners, mm -hmm. where has God been guiding you? Where have you had to have confidence? Text EW10 to 55000. Wait for a response or email us, morninggloryew10.com. Um, because, yeah. go ahead. I was just going to say, this reminds me of our discussion earlier about marriage. I mean, that's one of the things yes. that, you know, you you have to trust in the Lord and have good intentions and and. and walk in the way of what's right, you know, with holiness and to assume that there might not be any struggle and it's all going to be easy, breezy, lemon squeezy. That's just not the way of a mature, right. mature faith. Right. And so I love that we're talking about blessed John Henry, Henry Newman and his struggles, but yet he's about to be canonized. Right. And yeah, it wasn't and what, all smooth, right. And easy no, and stuff. In, mm. in fact, the thing that was, the the thing that really convinced him to be Catholic was the Arian crisis. So if our listeners aren't familiar, in the fourth century of the Arian heresy everywhere, bishops, everybody in the church was falling into Arianism, which is denying the divinity of Jesus. And it seemed like the light of faith had been extinguished. But as he studied that, um, and he studied the authentic teaching of the church on the incarnation in the fourth century, he realized that orthodox doctrine inevitably prevails Whenever there's a dispute that's raging within the church, he, he quote, mm -hmm. in his apology, he writes, I saw clearly that in the history of Arianism, the pure Arians were the Protestants, the semi-Arians were the Anglicans, and that the uh, Rome now was what it was then. The truth mm -hmm. lay not with the Via Media, but with what was called the extreme party, unquote. So it was fascinating because he discovered that there are times in the history of the church where the truth is ignored by everybody, it seems. But the truth remains the truth, that our Lord is with the church and that what he revealed to the apostles, what was handed on to the fathers of the church, what's been handed on to the magisterium, never changes. And that when the storms rage, we can stand on the rock of the truth of what Christ has taught us. So, Amen. It's, it's, it's Amen. Love that. Right? Stand on the rock, yo. So what else? We got a lot of emails. Got so emails. What's, what's in there? Mm -hmm. So Susan... Susan, was Susan Mary? Yeah. Uh, Susan yes, Mary Susan emailed, Mary. Mm -hmm. listening on Ave Maria radio app. I'm retired registered dental hygienist, and I worked at a community dental health clinic in Colorado Springs, uh, Peak Vista CHC. We offered service to people with no dental insurance and homeless, affordable scale for payment, and it is a mm. national program. What? Okay. Thank you, Susan Mary. We, I'm going to be Googling yeah, that and awesome. tweeting that out as soon as I find that information. We also heard from Stephanie listening to Ave, through Ave Maria, on Ave Maria Radio through TuneIn app. I never heard of it. Okay. She yeah. emailed, my good friends get together at, with others to provide a multitude of services to the homeless population in Detroit, including skin care, massages, haircuts, nail care, etc., to help give dignity and assistance in obtaining work. My friend sees this as her ministry and uses her time to evangelize and show Jesus' love. Oh, that's beautiful, Stephanie. Yeah, that's awesome. EWTN Radio is going to be broadcast at the Mass Canonization for John Henry Newman this Sunday. Get up early at 3.30. Gloria will slap you, and you can talk to her. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I'll give you a good. Yeah, I will. <laughs> and also we heard uh, Pope Francis tweeted out that he appointed Father Austin Vetter as the next Bishop of Helena, Montana. And we're going to have a great show on Morning Glory tomorrow. What do we be talking about, Deacon? How do you feel about using inclusive language in liturgical prayers? Yeah, you know and how I also, feel about that. Yeah, I know <laughs> how you feel already. So let's see. We, we'll also be talking about defending the Western world against those who demonize it. Mm. An important call. And today mm. in the Gospel, in the Gospel of Luke 10, 38 to 42, Lord reminds Martha, Martha, you're anxious and worried about many things. There's only need of one. Th There's need of only one thing. Mary's chosen the better part, and it will not be taken from her. Let's make sure we choose the better part today. Let's put, spend time in prayer with our Lord, especially if you can visit in the Eucharist, and allow Him to guide you and bless you. And now may God bless you, the Father, 
and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 This is Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast.